All right, how's everybody doing today? Good? How's the conference been? You like? All right, isn't this awesome? Okay. So, um, I, I have to confess, uh, when I wrote this, the abstract for this talk, and gave it to Tom and the rest of the people organizing the conference, I thought I was being a little clever um, with the title. Um, so, let me explain a little bit before I get to the meat of the topic. Uh, just open a socket, in case you haven't heard, is a meme on the internet, right? Uh, apparently someone said it in person, in earnest, um, at the Surge conference a couple years ago. And in the context of a highly technical conversation about like how do processes communicate between each other. And he's like, so how do you talk to another process? Oh, you just open a socket. It's no big deal, right? Okay. So here I am, at first I was laughing, hey, you know, <laughs> saying to myself, look how clever I am and how naive that person was. It's not just about opening sockets. So I thought it'd be great to have a nice chuckle about that, um, but also put it in the context of talking about how we work on client libraries and the client interfaces for, for React. Um, and I mean, you know, I work at Basho, we like think we're distributed systems experts, right? We got this network thing down, okay. So I told myself that, you know, as I'm patting myself on the back, you know, and I, hey, I've been working on React clients for like three years now, I must, I must know my shit. So, but then, I started researching this talk more in earnest, um, and I had to take a step back. And you know, although that, that, that just open a socket phrase is a little bit kind of off the cuff and probably naively presented, in some ways it is just kind of that simple, isn't it? I mean, you write a server, it opens a socket, right? It binds to an address, it listens, it accepts connections. And then on the other side, you have a client that just opens a socket and connects to that server. Okay, so that's, that's not such a big deal. And then you, you, you send bytes back and forth to kind of communicate however you need to communicate. And then, you know, you put the, all, that all together and you have this awesome application, right? Um, sorry for the, <laughs> the resolution on that. Um, but as I got deeper, I kind of got intimidated because there's so much more to it. Um, there's not just complexity related to the network, there's also complexity related to the proper design of the client application. I mean, I sort of summoned, knew some of this stuff, right? But uh, how do I convey this huge topic to all of you in a way that's you know, engaging and, and small enough to fit in 45 minutes? How do I make sense of it all? So I struggled. Um, and thankfully, Ben Folds pulled me out of it. So um, I'm not gonna claim that I know everything here, but I wanna just share with you a few of the things that I've learned along the way. And I'm not gonna act like I know when I don't know, so. So let's talk about my first hard lesson in talking to distributed systems. And that is, uh, if you may be familiar with React a little bit, we have some requests that have responses that stream back to you. So these are islands in the stream. How does this work? Um, so a stream, the idea of a streaming operation is that the client sends a request and it says, in this request, I want a streaming response. And then the server comes back over time with a number of results that are sent in multiple response packets or bundles or whatever. Um, and then finally, at the end of the stream, it says, hey, I'm done, there are no more results to send you. So streaming operations are great for large responses because both the client and the server don't have to bother buffering the entire response in order to do some, some useful work. Um, and it also that means that the client can proactively process those responses as they come in, rather than have to wait for the whole thing. Um, it also kind of fits nicely with the, the asynchronous delivery of messages in distributed systems, like Neil talked about, um, in that as soon as you get a result from some other computer in the distributed system that's doing some work, you can send it on to the client that requested that work to be done immediately. So React supports two of those operations, list keys and MapReduce. Um, so in HTTP, we have two client interfaces, if you're not familiar. In HTTP, uh, this is implemented as a chunked encoding. So you have a number of blocks of the response. Each is prefixed by how much is, you know, what the length of that block is. And then uh, in the protocol buffers, it just, it has discrete message sizes that are also length prefixed already. So it just sends messages until there's finally one that has a flag on it that says, hey, I'm done. Now, if you look at the sequence of events, it looks a lot like how you'd process it is as an iteration over those chunks that you receive. So uh, that's how I implemented the interface the first time, which is the first client I worked on was the Ruby client library. 
So uh, if you're not familiar with Ruby, you saw a little bit in Neil's talk, if you were in here, but uh, iteration is usually done using blocks. Blocks are essentially uh, lexically scoped closures, anonymous functions, uh, that you pass to the iterator, and then when it you know, encounters the next thing, it'll feed that result into your block, and you can do something with it uh, to process it. So initially, I was using a binding to lib curl uh, in, the, in the Ruby client library uh, for the HTTP stuff. So um, the neat thing about that is that you can, let's see, there it goes, uh, you can give uh, libcurl a block, a closure, um, that it will call whenever it receives a chunk of the response. And so what this meant is I could kind of thread those closures together, um, and then when I received a chunk from the, from the, the libcurl library, um, I could feed it back up into the client code that's actually using that data. So this made a natural transition to a, sort of a, a clean API um, through to the, the, the user's code uh, with a little wrap, wrapping. Except that works fine. <laughs> except when you're listing keys, and all of a sudden you get this error. Um, because, well, whoops, you made additional requests back to the server um, when you were in the middle of that block. Why does this happen? Okay, so there inside this wrapping of libcurl that I made, uh, there's an instance variable in this class that represents the connection um, that cached this connection, so you could reuse it on multiple sequential requests. Um, which is okay, you know, it's nice to reuse resources, keep your resource consumption low, but um, the main idea there also is that you would not incur that setup and teardown cost um, from sequential requests. You weren't connecting every time. Well, this didn't work in the streaming case. So I thought, okay, well, you know, the problem is concurrency, right? So let's make it a thread local variable instead, and no, that didn't work either. Why is it being corrupted? Well. I took a deeper look at it, and I'm sorry for the, the, the text there, it's a little hard to read. But this sequence diagram basically shows what happens in that streaming request interacting with the curl library. So if I were saying it, some kind of like get operation that returns a stream, right? Um, and then it creates a connection for the first time, it connects, it says, here's the block I want to call when I receive a chunk of the response. And then I'm going to go ahead and perform that HTTP request, it goes off, you know, does the network communication to the server. Curl, hey, it has a chunk of the response. It immediately yields that chunk back to the user code. Okay, the user code gets it, it says, hey, I wanna do something with this. I realize that there's some, like, information in here that I know about some other key that I wanna go fetch. And I'm gonna do that in the middle of this streaming. And so it calls back into the client layer and uses the same handle, which is bad because it's in the middle of processing a request. So this is a classic computer science problem called reentrancy, or something is reentrant if you can call it multiple times from within a code of execution that it's already in. So um, it's in the middle of its execution. It could, if it can be safely called again, then it is called reentrant. So, oops. Essentially, even in a single thread, I was doing things concurrently because something else called back into my code and made that reference to that connection basically invalid. I shouldn't have used it. So I had to remove this implicit global state. Now there's a long, like, fun story about the three or four different ways that I tried to do this, but it's kind of irrelevant at, at, at this point. The real answer is that I really need to use multiple connections. Regardless of whether I was, uh, you know, just had a single-threaded program, having multiple connections open, ones at the ready, was gonna be the right solution for connecting to this distributed systems. And distributed systems are designed to handle multiple connections at once. It's like their reason for being in a lot of ways. But the other thing is I needed to ensure safety. So it's not enough to connect multiple times. I have to make sure that those connections that I'm using are safe to use. Um, and especially if those connections are like TCP, right? Um, you don't wanna be interrupting the stream of bytes going back and forth to inject some other request, um, and the server may not know what to do with it. Your client side will probably get confused. So a way to solve this is to use a thread safe connection pool. Um, you can make one your own, or you can use one that's battle hardened. Um, I probably made the mistake of making one my own, but uh, it's a good experience. Okay, so let's talk about problem number two, bin packing. 
This is a problem we encountered um, in the 1.2 release of React. We found that uh, this customer, actually a customer you're trying to win at the time, um, they found that when they started making their secondary index requests against React 1.2, they were 20% slower. And we did a bunch of benchmarks and we're like, you know, they gotta be lying. There's, there's, there's no possibility here. Everything that we saw from down to the, the storage layer where the, the actual iteration over the index is done, um, up through the stack was faster than 1.2. Um, and so we didn't really have any good idea of why, why this was happening. An interesting tidbit came out later that we found that the customer was using Python, the Python client, and the protocol buffers interface. So essentially they, before, very recently, the Python client only supported secondary index queries using the MapReduce system. So it's kind of a roundabout way to do it, um, but this is important in understanding uh, why the problem occurred. So uh, my awesome colleague, Ryan Szeski, pulled out Dtrace. And if you do any system optimization, you need to know Dtrace, okay? So um, I think, I don't, I don't wanna pimp too much for them, but there's a nice training session in San Francisco in a couple weeks, you can go learn all about it. But basically, he instrumented the code on the server side to see, okay, what's, what's going on with uh, what's being called the most and how, how much time is it taking? And he found that uh, a number of functions that we call in the, in the um, Erlang side, the React side of, of the, the request, are being called a bunch of times and spending a lot of time in those calls. So we had kind of a hit list of, of things to look at. And then we started the performance whack-a-mole. Um, <laughs> so the person uh, holding the hammer ended up being Andrew Thompson. Um, if you haven't had a chance to see a talk from him, he's pretty awesome. He has some talks about React's multi-data center replication and other things. Um, but he's a real uh, performance guru. In fact, he wrote a set of blog posts about um, how GitHub was doing their Erlang Git daemon incorrectly and how to optimize it down to like 300 lines of code from 5,000 or something. Um, so he was the perfect person to do this. And then he didn't want to write the code, so I ended up becoming the hammer. <laughs> okay, so uh, basically Andrew did the profiling and I did the rewrites. Um, our first hack was uh, this, this function that was essentially creating uh, an output representation for the protocol buffers protocol. Um, so there's this thing in Erlang called IOLIS, and there's sort of a functional lazy way to create something that's just gonna be written out to disk or over a socket or whatever. Um, and essentially, the, it's a representation of a character stream, a stream of bytes. That IOLIS can be made up of lists, which are just like linked lists, like you typically think in a functional language, or binaries, which are sort of bit strings or arrays of bytes that are of fixed size. So you can combine these two things together um, into a, an arbitrarily deep uh, list that when it gets written out to the socket or to the file, um, it will actually be flattened into a single byte stream. So there are a number of functions, uh, list to binary, binary to list, and IO list to binary, which let you change between these data types. So what we found is the protocol buffers encoding uh, code called IO list to binary dozens of times. So every time it encoded a single field, it would maybe write out an I list and then flatten it to a binary. And then it would combine two fields together into a message and it would flatten those again. And then you get the whole thing together, maybe multiple messages and it would flatten those again. So we, this is a really expensive call because it's essentially the, a, a product of how many characters do you have and how deep is your list. So uh, we removed a bunch of that. In the end, we said, you know, this is just going out over socket or to a file, whoever, you know, is using it. Uh, we were sending it out over socket, so there's no reason to flatten that until it actually reaches the TCP interface. So that cut down a whole bunch of, of time. The next mole we whacked was dict. Uh, dict is a fun little module uh, that basically has a, a dictionary, a hash map um, type of data structure, but it's purely functional. So every time you modify that data structure, you get to copy it, right? Um, and if you see, this is an empty dict. There's nothing in this map. And look how big that is. It's got like one outer tuple plus a bunch of numbers and then a bunch of empty lists and inner tuples and that's like a lot of things to copy every time you wanna modify it. The 
the interesting aspect of that is we were using this inside the server state to keep track of you know, what requests might be going on, uh, what capabilities of the services that are being provided over the protocol are, and it ended up just being too inefficient because we had very few services and we had this huge dict to store them in. Um, and so that, that, was, that was wasteful. So we cut that out um, and just ended up using a, a flat list of key value pairs. And it was much, much faster and much more memory efficient. So this still, like, this cut down some uh, in terms of removing that, those calls from the top of the, the most called things. But in the end, we found it wasn't actually the thing that was called the most that was taking all this time. It was a call to send bytes over the wire. Now, that seems kind of weird. Um, but we found it was called very many times per response per total uh, secondary index response. Each call to the dr gen TCP driver, which uh, interestingly in Erlang, it's another process which happen happens to own some C code that actually sends the data over the, the, the socket, right? Um, so when you're sending a message to, or you want to do gen TCP send, you're actually sending a message to a process that owns a port that you know, writes it out on the wire. So you've got several steps. And that round trip was taking at least 30 milliseconds every time, and we have really tiny payloads, so like, you know, five or six bytes. Yeah, that's not gonna fill a TCP packet. So, we found, we found our, our smoking gun. The MapReduce results coming back were really tiny. We get like a few keys that were resulting from this secondary inter index request. Okay, we pack those together, they make a really tiny payload, we send it immediately to be a gen TCP. And that was a really inefficient use of the, the network stack. So, the sends were really tiny. And we also, in addition to just the call to the TCP stack, we're probably invoking Nagel's al algorithm. How many of you know Nagel's algorithm? What it means? Oh, good. All right, <laughs> bravo. So Nagel basically buffers things until it gets a packet that's large enough if you're sending lots of little tiny messages. So uh, for network efficiency. So then I was like, okay, so we know that the problem is we're calling this too often. What can we do? I researched a little bit, and there's this thing um, called the maximum transmission unit that everybody needs to know. How, it's basically how many bytes can I send in a single frame on the wire? That includes all of the IP and TCP overhead. So this is my screenshot from Wikipedia. Thank you, Wikipedia. Um, but essentially, an Ethernet frame, which most of our networks are on Ethernet, um, allows about 1,500 bytes in the payload, which you can see the, the sixth uh, column over there, uh, but also has a minimum of 42. So you don't really want to send something uh, that is less than 42 bytes if you can avoid it. So our solution was let's buffer up all of our outgoing messages up to one kilobyte or so, and then if we have if we don't have any more MapReduce messages coming in because these are flying in really fast, they're really tiny, right? Um, then we can just okay, let's flush the buffer to the TCP driver because we're probably not going to get any more. Um, for a little bit. And the great thing about this is our performance improved to pre 1.2 levels. So I think the takeaway here is that you have to understand the network stack. Like TCP works if you know what you're doing. And if you understand that it's not just like a, a stream of bytes, although it may appear like that, you actually have to break it into chunks and the network does that for you. So uh, understanding that is, is interesting. Okay, so let's all get aboard the failed request. Um, <laughs> I hope you've already realized from this conference that distributed systems fail in really interesting and strange ways. Um, among the failures are lots of things, including like the node goes down, there's a slow node, there's delay between the nodes, packets are dropped, links are flappy back and forth, you might have TCP incast, things get corrupted, and you also have like application level logical failures you have to deal with. So this is a huge number of ways that your whole thing can go down in flames. The interesting thing is, from the client's perspective, it's really hard to tell what the difference between some of these errors is. So um, this took a long time to, to think about, and I, I actually, I'm gonna call him out a bunch of times. Thank you, Kyle, you're awesome. Um, helping me tease this apart. Um, so I feel like there are about two different types of errors that your client needs to deal with. Uh, the first one, and, and really obvious one, is system-related or network errors. So um, things like the connection was refused or it was aborted 
or it was reset, the network was unreachable, so you had no path to that host, uh, the network was down, or you have some other sort of like um, Erno type message, right, you know, EM file or something. Those uh, are the sorts of things that are system errors, okay? And then in addition to that, you have some other things where the entire system is working, but you have results you didn't expect. And these are things like you tried to fetch a key and it wasn't there. Um, you didn't meet the quorum it needed to satisfy the request for you, and this is specific to React, of course. Um, or you had too many errors when trying to, whoops, I went back accidentally. You had too many errors when trying to satisfy that request. So like actually something was wrong when the vNode uh, tried to read that key. Um, something's corrupted on disk. Or you might have a request that's just badly formatted and the server is saying, no, I'm not gonna accept that request because you need to fix X, Y, Z. Um, and then there's other more subtle things like some minor thing on the server erred and caused some failure propagation and your client can't do anything about it. And then there's this kind of nebulous one, which I struggled to put in any place, which is the timeout. Timeout is a tricky beast. We have so many possible conditions that result in a timeout. Uh, first of all, uh, who can tell me what the purpose of a timeout is? Chirp, chirp, somebody up there, shout it out. Exactly, so it's about liveness, right? We don't want one component waiting on another one forever because it may have some failure that happens and not know to give up. So um, it, it is a way to preserve liveness without uh, necessarily knowing what happened in the, in the long run. So we, since we can't distinguish between an in, indefinite delay and an actual failure, you just have to give up. The problem is, of course, when we start putting timeouts all over the place, right? <laughs> you know, which component timed out? What, is, is this a semantic timeout? Like, you know, I decided on my client side that I'm gonna set a timeout, read timeout on the socket and you know, I didn't get any data back, so I'm gonna give up there. Or maybe it's some component in React uh, where it says, okay, I like sent out all these messages to the nodes around the ring, um, but I didn't get back a useful, any useful information in time, and so I've gotta tell the client, hey, I, I gave up. Um, so in, in terms of how to deal with these errors, we have to think about each one slightly differently. So I think generally in terms of most system and network errors, the right answer is to retry. Um, often these are caused by an intermittent, intermittent failure, uh, might be indicative of a failure like a node being down or being restarted so it can be upgraded. And those are sorts of things where if you're building a distributed system that's redundant, um, you can connect to some other node and uh, maybe get your request to complete. So often those are things that can be retried. Obviously some things like in the kernel, you basically wanna give up. Like if you can't open any more file descriptors to make a connection to the server, you're kinda of screwed. Um, so it's, it's not a, a hard and fast rule, but that's, I think that's generally the case. As far as getting unexpected results, uh, retrying is a little trickier, and I think it's very case specific. If the thing you're doing is item potent, it's generally safe to retry, right? Because there's not gonna be extra effects. Now, the flip side of that is, if you're doing a write, a modify, it might appear to be item potent, but you have additional effects that are caused by that write that might in the end result in it not being item potent and that sort of being a pathological uh, situation. Now, I, uh, since I have a, a little bit of time and I'm moving quickly, uh, I'll tell a little story about one of our customers recently. Um, they have two data centers with big React clusters in them and they decided um, that their application can talk to either data center. Um, and depending on which one appears to be up, it may send writes to one or the other. Well, they had some sort of network event uh, that caused uh, the, the data centers to appear alternately offline and online to the application. And so they started writing to one side, and it says, oops, it failed, let's retry on the other side, oh, it failed, and back and forth and back and forth, trying to write the same key. Um, so the interesting thing is, <laughs> This actually made the problem worse, right? Their, their cluster went down because they got these big uh, objects. You know, React doesn't decide for you how to resolve your objects when you have a conflict. It looked like a write conflict, and so they had these you know, 50,000 sibling objects. 
So don't do that. <laughs> okay, so, um, and then timeouts. Um, whether to retry those isn't always clear, but I think in, in, the, in the general case, depending on the component that timed out, obviously, um, maybe you wanna back off and retry it later. So that's sort of an, uh, an unanswered question in my mind. But the takeaway from this is you need to prepare, prepare for failure. You have to have a way to recover because uh, your client isn't privy to all the information necessarily that the rest of the distributed system has. That knowledge is distributed by its design. So you have to go on your best knowledge. And the other thing is don't retry indefinitely. Otherwise you can get those like, you know, thousand sibling things and that would be bad. Okay, final topic. Spread the load. So traditionally, most of our client libraries were like this. You had a client sitting in an application and it would connect to one node. And that was really easy to design, to code, to think about. Um, may, maybe given that first section that I talked about, they make multiple connections to that node. But if you just keep connecting to this node, things might get a little hot on that one node. <laughs> And you notice the other nodes are kind of twiddling their thumbs. There's a lot of traffic going to that one, um, and that may cause lots of problems. So we've historically said, you know, maybe you should put some kind of proxy load balancer in front of this. And this is nice because then you don't have to worry about like changing your application significantly. You just put this piece of infrastructure in front, and it spreads the requests out to all the nodes, and things are happy. And this definitely resolves the dogpiling problem. Uh, but it introduces other operational issues. Now you have a new piece of infrastructure to manage. How do you configure it? What's the right node selection policy? Um, how do you detect whether a node is up or down? These are all sorts of things that often the proxy software will, or hardware will decide for you, but um, requires deep knowledge of the network. So over time, we gradually started to make our clients able to speak directly to all nodes in the cluster. Now, currently uh, the Ruby client and the Python client and the Java client all have this working on the others. The nice thing about this is the client can round robin connections to, to nodes, like the load balancer. So there's no additional functionality there, right? But the other thing that it can understand is when I receive a request that, or response that is like a network failure, obviously I wanna connect to a different node because it's probable that that node has gone down. That's something that the client can decide because it understands the cluster, right? Uh, the other thing it could do is retry those failed requests on some other node, even if the, no the connection isn't invalid. So you can do those sorts of like uh, context specific uh, recoveries. The other thing that we can do that's really nice is track the occurrence of those errors. So when I go to open a new connection, I can say, okay, which, which node has given me the most successes over the last you know, 30 seconds or something? And choose that node instead of one that has been failing every time I tried to connect to it. So we reduce the operational complexity and there's few moving parts. The other aspect is performance. I love this, uh, this interaction. So Julio Capote, I don't know how many of you know him, uh, used to work at Posterous. They were recently acquired by Twitter. Um, but when they switched to this client side uh, implemented load balancing thing, uh, they saw a 3x speed up because they were talking to multiple nodes. And again, I have to call it Kyle. He wrote the first version of this for me. He's speaking tomorrow, I'll go to his talk, it's gonna be fun. Um, but the, the nice thing about this, this connection pool is it's error sensitive, so it tracks which nodes fail um, their requests or connections or whatever. Uh, it's thread safe, so you're never gonna get a connection that is already in use. Um, and I didn't have to write most of it. <laughs> I ended up translating this for the Python client. It was a nice, nice uh, translation exercise. So moral of the story, spread your connections around. If any node can do the work, send the work to it. There's no reason to dogpile on a single node. If you have something, more than one than something, use them all. Okay. So in summary, um, open multiple connections. One connection is not gonna be good enough. I don't care if you have a single threaded program, open more, it's going to help. Protect them from concurrent use. Don't use them unsafely. It is important to know the structure of your network stack and how it works. Uh, it informs so many other aspects of, of your, your program and your infrastructure. And if you can, categorize those failures and decide how to recover from them or whether to recover from them. And finally, if you've got a distributed system, connect to as many of the parties in that distributed system as you can. And a final note, 
Um, I think that this, this conclusion is a little bit harder to get to, but I want to talk about passivity and the idea of clients as, as passive uh, actors in the system. I think it, it may be seductive to see the application as a passive observer just gathering information that it can along the way, but in fact, the application, the client, even if it acts as an observer, it tries to act as an observer, that acting affects the system. It sends requests. It waits for the responses. It takes actions on those responses, which may result in further requests and create other effects in the system. Its presence, honestly, is the reason the system exists, so it has to act as a participant. And this is known in physics as the observer effect. In order to gather knowledge about the state of the system, one must interact or perturb it. It's impossible to be passive. So I like to think of it uh, like the raindrop falling in this puddle. The action happens at one point, but the effects are felt across the entire surface as the impact of the droplet reverberates through the puddle. Where the waves get, the waves of multiple droplets encounter each other, things get chaotic. Things get interesting. They interact in surprising ways. In fact, if you look back at Bob Metcalf's original design of Ethernet, all the endpoints were equal on that wire, even the PDP-11. <laughs> um, and one might say he envisioned it uh, more like radio than like a telephone line. Um, you know, um, although modern networks do packet switching and buffering and all of that such that there's not actually one party t or multiple parties talking on the wire at the same time, uh, any communication at all still consumes those resources. Um, and if, if effectively, affecting all of the parties connected. As a side note, you might note that, um, that modems and Wi-Fi were invented in 1972. So next time you open a socket, talk to a distributed system, realize that you're not the spectator up here in the stands, you're the player here down on the field. Thank you. Great, I have lots of time for questions. Yes? In the smarter clients that you're talking about, um, what are the strategies for reintroduction of the nodes as a candidate to talk to it? Okay, so the question is, uh, how do you reintroduce nodes that had errors accounted? Um, actually, what, what we do, um, and this is, again, a piece of Kyle's brilliance, thank you, I'm gonna keep extolling his praises. Um, you have a decaying average. So every time you receive an error, you decrease the average. Uh, it may go the other direction, actually. But basically, you, every time you log an error, it increases or decreases that value. And then over time, that value gradually approaches the, the, the positive, you know, fully healthy value. So it's sort of probabilistic in the sense that uh, initially, that error is gonna count against it really heavily. But then over a period of time, when you go to check what is the health of that, that node, it's going to return to healthy as long as no new errors have been encountered. So I think, I think the, the, the time period there is like 10 seconds. Um, so it's really quick. Um, but if you're having a lot of errors from that node, it's obviously not going to get selected as much for a while. Right. So I, just to repeat what Kyle said, the, the retries prevent you from hitting that error over and over again because you were to retry on a different node. Yes? So you mentioned this already out, this is part of the Ruby client now? This, this connection pool thing with error sensitivity is part of the Ruby client. It's been part of the Ruby client for like 18 months now. And it's just recently part of the Python client. Yes? Um, so how does that work? If you have multiple applications, how do you handle routing with the client? Like that if the client is handling its own node selection? Right. So. Okay, so um, the question is how do you, if you have multiple applications, how do you handle writing or routing the requests? Um, basically, it has a blanket pool for each protocol. Um, connections in that pool are allocated to specific nodes when they are demanded. So um, future work that I intend to do is actually have a bound on the size of that pool, but right now it's currently unbounded, and that's partly because most Ruby and Python applications don't get really very concurrent and so they might only have like five or six connections open at one time. Um, but that's, that's definitely a, a, an architectural limitation right now. But essentially, 
when your, your application, maybe it's running in the same process, uh, your other application makes a request, it goes to the top level client object, which has that pool, and then it says, do I have a connection available? If it doesn't, it creates one. If there's one available, it'll, it'll grab it and hand it to whatever request needs to be done, and then removes it from selection of the pool. Have a value concurrence system or a dynamic right. node configuration. Is your advice still that sort of client approach, or would you say no, you need the proxy? Oh, so if you, you need to reconfigure the client is what you're asking, you have nodes changing? Uh, that, I, I don't know, that remains to be seen. One of the things that we want to look into uh, over the next six to nine, nine months is actually having the React server occasionally tell you, hey, he, here's the other nodes I know about, so you might go like reconfigure your pool to connect to them as well. Um, that doesn't currently exist, but uh, we've thought a lot about it, so. Good question. Any others? Happy to take questions about other things, too. Tom. How come you always add a second hashtag to your uh, talks? Because I want... <laughs> Context. <laughs> yes, Michael. So, <clears throat> what can we... So, I mean, really interesting talk. Having designed some client libraries before, it's really cool to see like what the best practices are and how those best practices change with respect to the service that you're interacting with. So, sort of tangentially to this, what can the server do to give us feedback about clients that are connecting to it and interacting with it in some way? Like I thought that idea is cool that it could tell you about other nodes that right. it knows about, but like Camille brought up in her Zookeeper talk, one thing you have to watch out for in Zookeeper is that a, a bad client yeah. that can take down your whole cluster, and we've seen you see that in pretty much you know bad clients, bad client behavior is really bad in the distributed system. So what can the what can the server itself do to help alleviate those? Right, um, and that, it's great that you brought that up. Uh, so, sorry, the, the subject of the topic, if you couldn't hear, or the question or comment was, uh, how do you deal with bad clients uh, from the server side? Uh, there's been some interesting work by um, our uh, core engineers, they work on React's distribution layer, to propagate uh, that information of, I'm going into an overload scenario all the way back to the clients, and now, um, Hopefully in the 1.4 release, it'll be able to return you a result that says, hey, I'm overloaded, which is sort of like, in HTTP terms, the 503, you know, service unavailable. Um, in which case, your client has to decide, how am I gonna deal with that? Um, a good client would obviously say, you know, that's sort of like a timeout. I'm probably hammering the thing too, too much. I might wait a little bit and then try again. Um, which is, is related to the, um, the strategy that TCP takes with congestion control. If an act takes too long to come back, then we've got to, you know, decrease the window of packets that we wait for, um, or the, the window of packets that we send across. So um, I think it's a complicated thing to build, um, but propagating that information from the very low level of, I'm taking a long time to write to disk, to, oh, I've got too many requests in flight, to, hey, client, you need to back off. Um, I think that it's important for the server to convey that, um, and then, of course, the clients to respect it. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Yes? Uh, the business factor of a single server or a single node, it would be nice if you could do that in stats as well, because then load balancers could actually, as part of their health check, view this stat and say, wait the <coughs> load respectively. Right, and some, uh, so the, the, the comment was uh, maybe the, some stats should come back with that overload uh, response. Um, some, um, some services have been known, and I, I'm sorry, I'm in context of HTTP here, but it could apply to any protocol, to return a retry after header that says, hey, wait this long until you retry this request. That sort of thing might be, might be helpful, um, or, uh, or simply just you know, giving an, as you say, giving an idea of the capacity that's being used would, I agree, would be very helpful. Be careful not to do more work to tell people that you're overworked. Right. right. Angel said, you have to do, you have to be careful not to do more work to tell people you're overworked. Um, that's a problem with engineering, too. <laughs> All right. I think I'm out of time. Thank you, guys. <laughs>